Canadians are ready for change. And we're ready too. With a smile from the start, Tom Mulcair has run a front-runner's campaign, leading in most polls by the narrowest of margins, playing it safe. He's been moving his party to the centre of the political spectrum, prompting criticism from the left, but also second looks from those who counted him out in the past. We met in the tiny town of saint anne des lacs in the Laurentians. So Canadians say they want change. Polls suggest up to 70% say they want change. Um, what are you offering and how fast are you offering it in terms of change? Well, we're offering the team with the experience and the plan uh, to defeat Stephen Harper and replace him and to start repairing some of the damage that he's done. It's been a rough 10 years on the economy. So we've got a plan to kickstart the economy, lower taxes for small and medium-sized businesses who are the job creators, make life easier for the middle class by bringing in $15 a day quality childcare, some of the ideas that we're putting on the table. But how soon would they see change? Well, as soon as we were able to form a government, we would see change in our attitudes internationally. I'd love nothing more than to go to Paris at the Conference of the Parties in December and get Canada on track. That will be the most important conference on climate change since the signature of Kyoto. Here at home, there's more inequality than ever, and we've got to start reducing that gap. We'll start by doing things very concrete, like taking the CEO stock option tax loophole, eliminating it, but that, help seniors those are, in poverty. Those, those are budgetary measures, right? They can all be done right away, though. But what do you mean by right away? Well, because when people budget, want change, they want to see it, like now. So what are we talking it's about? It's taken 10 years for us to get there. We've got a clear plan, long term. Sustainable development for me is not a slogan. It's something that I've done. What I mean by that is we'll put in place a clear plan for economic growth, a clear plan to help the middle class, a clear plan to clean up the environment. So we're going to change the way things so have been So are done. you telling me they would see change, they would notice change very quickly well, if the NDP were to attain power? When I was trying to get all of us to rise above partisanship, when we saw those horrible images of that little boy on that beach in Turkey, I was putting forward a plan to get 10,000 Syrian refugees to Canada before the end of the year. I would prefer if Mr. Harper were to start doing that right away, but you can count on us to get it done right away. Please. So that would be something we would see right away, yeah. a move in terms of the refugee situation? Yeah. Now, there are two people vying to be the agent of change, to try and grab onto that 70% or whatever the figure is of those who want change, and they, of course, are you and Mr. Trudeau. Now, some argue that they cannot tell the difference. What's the difference between what you're offering and what Mr. Trudeau's offering? A clear plan, consistency. You know, Mr. Trudeau, in the space of eight weeks, has gone from saying that he's going to balance the budget every year to saying that he's going to run massive deficits. He said that he would have voted against C-51. He claimed to be against it, but then he voted for it. So he's all over the map. We've got clear positions. It's a well-stated plan, long-term, to grow the economy, make life better for middle-class Canadians. October 19th, Tom Mulcair and the NDP win the election. You walk in there, you've got 75 cent dollar, you have 45 dollar oil, mm -hmm. you're in a recession. What is the first thing you do once you achieve power in terms of the economy? Well, we would start trying to kickstart the economy and we would start with the people who create 80% of new jobs in Canada. So we've said that we will immediately start reducing the taxes for our small and medium-sized businesses because they are the job creators. So that's something that we would do immediately. By how much? We've said it would go from the current 11 down to 9. Mr. Harper has said that he'll do that over four years. We would start that immediately. When you say start that immediately? We would do an immediate one point drop and then a second one point drop within a year. Let me, let me give you a list of different things that currently exist that are fairly recent in terms of um, benefits or non-benefits to, to Canadians. Yeah. And let me ask you to kind of do a checklist on what you would do with that list. Sure. A yes or no on continuing certain things. Now you're asking a lot for a politician to give you a one-word answer, but I'll give it my best <laughs> yeah, shot. Okay, well, let's give it a try. Uh, the UCCB, the Universal Child Care yes. Benefit, does it stay or does it go? It stays because it's taxable and high-end earners 
pay most of it back in taxes, but almost all of it flows into the pockets of people on the lower end of the spectrum, and that's a good thing. So there'd be no change in that? No change in the UCCP for the NDP. TFSAs, the uh, tax-free saving account. The most recent increase in the last budget we would eliminate. So it, you would keep it at 5000 exactly. not go to 10000 Exactly. Um, the corporate tax rate. Yes. You talked about the small business tax yes. rate. What about the corporate tax rate? We'll raise it. It's currently at 15. We're going to raise it reasonably. Uh, it'll be, stay below what it has been as an average under the Conservatives, but they're the only Canadians not paying their fair share right now. And would that be in the first budget? Or would that, that be would right be, away? That would be in the first budget. How fast would the first budget come? Well, it would be in the spring of 2016, on schedule. I'll let Mr. Harper's uh, fiscal year uh, terminate. I don't know what his books are actually going to look like. GST, do you touch the GST? No, it's a very regressive tax. It hurts the poor the most. We won't be touching the GST. So no matter what happens in terms of the overall uh, bottom line on the government's books, you wouldn't go to the GST to help rescue you? No, because we're a social democratic party. We believe in reducing inequality in our society. and. That type of tax is very regressive. It hurts p poor people the most, and we would not go there. Um, income splitting. We're going to get rid of the new income splitting that they brought in for the richest uh, people in Canada. But the income splitting that is allowed for retired seniors on their pensions, we would maintain that. You've gone through that list. You've talked earlier in terms of the uh, daycare program and other things that are going to cost money. Yes. Um, and a lot of people are wondering, how are you going to pay for all this and still come in with what you say will be a flat bottom line? You, it will, you will not go into yes. deficit. Our first, our first uh, budget, our first fiscal year, will be a balanced budget. We firmly believe in that, and it's something that I will accomplish. But when, when, I, the, when the Conservatives suggest that you're the black hole, as they describe it, for the sure. NDP is $35 billion at sure. least. It, it's just stuff that they're making up. We looked at one of the line items when they sent out Jason Kenney. On one item on housing, he was off by a factor of eh, five. He had five billion dollars where we had 940 million. So if they're going to make stuff up about us, Peter, I hope you don't mind if I just uh, knock down those straw men one after the other. You claim you're going to come up with a, a full costing of everything? Absolutely, that's right. And obligation. how you will achieve yes. a, 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 a non-deficit position yes, a by mid-September? Balanced budget. Yes, the NDP has the best record for balanced budgets of any political party in Canada, and I'm going to maintain that proud tradition, yeah. It's not happening in Manitoba. It's not happening in Manitoba now, but they've done quite well despite the ups and downs. They've got a very low unemployment rate, and they've done fairly well despite having very serious social challenges. But there are challenges facing all governments right now. Yeah. I mean, you can ask the, the Liberal leader about Liberal governments here and there. You can ask Mr. Harper about various Conservatives gov governments that have been there. But I'm the person who's going to be leading the NDP government, and look at our track record for balanced budgets. If you uh, win the election, can you see us sitting here a year from now and you looking at me and saying, look, global economic conditions made this much tougher than I thought it was going to. They left me with a, a mess in the, in the books. And you know what? There's no way that we could have ever come in. I don't in blame you for asking position. that question. It's a classic. Uh, and well, it's I've a seen classic government, for a reason. No, not the question, the, the, yeah. the, the response. And I've, right. and I've seen it in, in my many years, both as an elected official and uh, as a senior public administrator. But what I'm saying to you is this. I don't believe in leaving that on the backs of future generations. There have been times, like the massive recession we went through in 08, where it was absolutely necessary for the government to move rapidly, to staunch that, and to spend more than we were taking in. We encouraged that. We were in favor of it. But that was the worst recession since the 1920s. So if, not this, the if, if this right current, now. but if this current situ recession situation turned into something like that, you would have to rethink your strategy. We're not in that position. And right now we know that we've gone through a predictable drop. I mean, it's cyclical, but Mr. Harper did nothing to prepare for or react to the predictable drop. He had made a massive bet, Peter, on oil and gas. He had made the, the economy, the whole economy, less diverse, less balanced. Let me read you a quote as we shift topics. Uh, you said this to me in an interview two and a half years ago. February 2013. The simple fact of the matter is that you don't wake up the day after an election and snap your fingers and say, poof, you're gone. You know what you're talking about? Yes. The Senate. Yes. Um, you've made abolishing the Senate, just as all your predecessors in, this, in NDP in leadership the NDP, yes. Have, have, <laughs> yes, have, uh, have said, um, you want to abolish the Senate. Yes, I do. How much of a priority is it? The day, Peter, that they had the temerity 
to reverse legislation on climate change that Jack Layton had successfully had adopted by the elected people in the House of Commons, it made me realize that it is time for us to get that change. But is it a priority? Well, it's a priority to the extent that I want a mandate for it on October 19th. It's a priority to the extent that I will make the effort to continue to meet with the premiers, and I know how tough it's going to be. But we go after these jobs because all the easy things have already been done. But if you win on October 19th, you would take that mandate, at least partially, as a signal that Canadians want to abolish the Senate. Absolutely. How do you govern, though, um, knowing that you want to abolish the Senate when you actually need the Senate to... Um, govern. Many of the things you've talked about earlier in this discussion are going to have to eventually go through the Senate yep. to get passed. Absolutely right. So do you appoint a government leader in the Senate? No. no. I'm not going to be appointing any senators, no. And I, but, I, but, uh, so how do you get things through the Senate? Well, the Senate's going to have to realize that there's a government that's just been elected with, I would hope, a majority in the House of Commons. And when that legislation is enacted, or at least adopted, by the people who have been put there by Canadian voters, they're going to be given the legislation and asked to pass it in turn so that it can be promulgated into law in the country. And you think they'll do that? I mean, there have been times when they haven't even passed their own party's <laughs> legislation. Why would they pass yours? You want to kill them. Well, I want to get rid of unelected, unaccountable senators. You're right. That's been a long-standing position of our party. For once, I agreed with Mr. Harper because he chose to imitate my suggestion that we allow it to simply wither on the vine. I'm not going to name senators. The NDP is not going to name senators. We can't go against that fundamental belief. Mr. Harper talked a good game about getting rid of the Senate, but he threw in the towel. He, he gave up. I called him after the Supreme Court decision. I said, you're going to make me do this alone. I, it was a lighthearted conversation, but I was really surprised because he immediately threw in the towel after having gotten elected on a promise to either profoundly reform the Senate or get rid of it, and he was doing neither. But I, 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 you sound like you're just going to go on good faith to get all the other things that you think are incredibly important, whether it's daycare or, or other I'm going to have Canadians working with me. I'll have a mandate from the Canadian voting public. And I'll also know that across the country, people want quality, affordable $15 a day childcare. And for us, it's a top priority in this campaign. And yeah, if we put that into, into our, one of our measures and the Senate tries to, to block it, well, that will be part of what Canadians have to decide on their own, isn't it? And I'll talk to Canadians about that. Clarity Act. Yes. Is that a priority for you to repeal the Clarity Act? No, it's not. We've looked at the Supreme Court decision, which says that you need two things. You need qualitative clarity, which goes to things like the clarity of the question. But Peter, Canadians know this about me, that I was there fighting for our country. I was there in the front trenches of the National Assembly for almost 15 years doing my job of standing up for Quebecers, but also standing up for a united Canada. So the only people who are raising this right now that I know of are Gilles Duceppe and Justin Trudeau. Well, I'm raising it because I want to know about the 50.1 the number. Well, the 50.1 is the same number that applied in Pierre Trudeau's 1980 referendum. It was the but same it number that applied in the Clarity Act. Well, the, Not in that clear wording. If you can find, for me, in the Clarity Act, any number, then you're a better man than I am. No, I realize The Clarity not. Act is anything but clear. And you can't say to Canadians, we're going into this without even setting a number. And you can't go into it telling Quebecers, by the way, the number is whatever you get plus a whole bunch more. You can't play it that way. So you can when only you talk, talk about, about changing the Clarity Act, a you would want a firm number put in there, and your number is 50.1. We have put together a Unity Act, which has been published, which is right there on the public record, and I invite anyone to look at it. But what We're about eliminated. the number? The number is to, dis to, to begin the discussion according to our interpretation is if you have a clear question and you have clear voting conditions and everybody's played by the same rules, we're going to say the same thing that the British Parliament said in the case of the Scottish referendum. The side that wins, wins. The Liberals claim that it's more. Fine. What's the number? They won't give one. They're playing a game. And it's a dangerous game. It's a game that they're playing you're, to you're, talk to the rest of the You're not actually saying the number to me. You mean 50.1 when you say when you win, you win, right? What I'm saying is that the side that wins, wins. That's the That's rule 50. in a democracy. That's 50.1 or more, That's right? That's the rule in a democracy. Those are the rules we played by in 1980. Those are the rules we played by in 95. Those are the rules that Great Britain just played by. The fight against ISIS, does it change dramatically and immediately 
if the NDP takes power? Well, we've said clearly, and that's very much on the public record, that we will immediately stop the bombing mission and bring those troops home. So Promise. all Canadian forces there, including those on, on, on training missions, would be brought home? We will immediately withdraw our troops from Iraq uh, and to the extent that they are doing some bombing in Syria and from Syria. So we are out of the fight with ISIS if the NDP win? Yes. Yes, no question about that. You're comfortable with that position? I'm profoundly in favor of that position. Does ISIS pose a threat to Canada and Canadians? Peter, I know it poses a threat to Canada and Canadians. It's con continued war in a region that's known almost nothing but for 35 years. So I think that the best thing for Canada to do is to start playing a positive role for peace. And that's, that would be a top priority for me as the Prime Minister of Canada. Every indication so far is this is going to be an incredibly close election. Now, there's still a long way to go. I'm hoping to make it less close. <laughs> yeah. but there's still, and there's still a long way to go. Yeah. But at this point, at this stage in, in the campaign, one has to look at the possibility, if not the likelihood, of a minority government. Does the party, in a minority situation, that winds up with the most seats, have the automatic right to govern? Well, under our system of government, uh, that would normally be the case. But there are constitutional conventions that are, that are complex, uh, that are historically applied differently. I think that uh, my adversaries take this, the approach that, that you've just described, and it's certainly the one that I would take. So whoever has the most number of seats should have the right to govern. It's a complex constitutional convention, as you know. Uh, there have been instances in the past where governments have tried to hold on. It also raises the question of formal agreements, coalitions. Is, is that kind of a discussion, or should that kind of a discussion, be taking place among like-minded parties? And at the moment, the like-minded parties, in spite of differences in policy, would be the Liberals and the NDP, who both want the Conservatives gone. You're right. My priority is to defeat Stephen Harper and replace him with a progressive, social democratic NDP government. But back in 2008, we tried. I was part of that. Jack Layton and others, me included, worked with the Liberals to form a coalition. The Liberals turned up their noses on their own signature, and you know what? Seven years later, we're still stuck with Stephen Harper. Every time I have opened that Players door... Players are all different now, though. Every time I've opened the door with the current Liberals, Mr. Trudeau has personally slammed it. He's gone so far as to say that he could work with the NDP, but he can't work with me. Could you work with Justin Trudeau? I've said that many times, that my priority is to get rid of Mr. Harper, and I have opened that door several times, but it's he himself who has slammed the door shut conclusively every time we've raised it. And when you say conclusively, does that mean it's uh, unopenable between now and the 19th or in the days immediately following the 19th, depending on what the situation is? What I've said all along, is that we were willing to work to make sure that we replace Stephen Harper's Conservatives. Can you describe to me the difference in the terms of the leadership style of Tom Mulcair and Stephen Harper? I would have to ask you to become the pundit for the analysis of Mr. Harper. I know that he's my adversary and I face him every day in the House and I stand up to him. But how, what should Canadians assume they will be seeing in a Prime Minister Tom Mulcair that would be different than what they're seeing in terms of style, in terms of how they lead? Well, I think, Peter, that the main thing that we'll see is a leader who's very open, very transparent. Um, on that point, former NDP MP, Bruce Heyer, now running for the Greens, has had some pretty harsh words about your leadership style. Calls you a ruthless man who will say and do anything to get elected just like Stephen Harper. He would be another dictatorial prime minister. Yeah. Well, here's what happened with Bruce, and I haven't talked about it very much publicly, but Bruce simply informed all of us that he would never be able to follow party line on anything. So that's not dictatorial. I've got a, a whole caucus of nearly 100 people who under my leadership have been able to take a strong fight to Stephen Harper. That from someone who walked away from the party on a single issue, I'll let Canadians decide that, but I, I, I'm not going to respond to that in kind. I could go a lot further. Last question, and it's more personal than
political or even about, it's not about policy or party, it's about, it's about you. And I've asked each of the leaders this. What is it about Tom Mulcair that would make a Prime Minister? Why do you think you can be Prime Minister of Canada? The fire in my belly, and some of us have more than others, um, is, and what gets me up every day is to try to make this a fairer society and play a positive role on the world stage and make this a better Canada. To bring back a, a role for Canada that we can aspire to again, we can be proud of, and be proud at home as well. Remove inequality in our society, make this a better place, create opportunities, start taking care of public protection, not let companies inspect their own railways. And you're drifting into policy. Well, the it's question policy is about is... you, and I mean, you, you've been on this land since you were a kid, right? Sure. Swimming in this lake. Yeah. What is it about you that you think can make the prime minister? I think that we as Canadians want to have a government that is a reflection of our fundamental goodness. Canadians want change in Ottawa. They're tired after 10 years of Stephen Harper's Conservatives. They want a fresh approach. And what the NDP has always represented are those values, and that's the type of government that I'll lead. Mr. Mulcair, thanks very much. For Thank you, Peter. Time.